There we go. We have a lot of our attendees starting to roll in. So I'll just uh, wait another two minutes before we introduce ourselves and everybody. Um, if anybody, um, if you want to drop into the chat while we're waiting, we would love to hear a little bit more about where everybody's visiting us from, um, whether you're New Mexico local or elsewhere. It would be cool if uh, you want to drop by where, where you're coming from um, while we're getting ready and letting these last couple people in. Wow, Philadelphia, Queens, um, Santa Fe, and uh, Livermore, California, getting all over. Um, thank you everybody for joining us all over the place. Um, White Rock, New Mexico, New York State, awesome. Um, well, I'll go ahead and start us off and um, thank you everybody for joining us for this special counter narrative series. This is going to be the uh, first in a series of three on uh, nuclear energy in New Mexico from an indigenous perspective. Um, and the counter narrative is really was built as a forum where we can unpack and discuss trending and difficult or misunderstood and divisive topics in a very safe and comfortable forum. Um, so in this particular topic, radioactive history, um, there's some good things and bad things about it over history. So um, we're really excited that this first session, we can really unpack the history and science itself. Um, so, oh, as a way of introduction, my name is Rachel Moore. I'm the curator of exhibitions um, and I'm just gonna be helping facilitate this conversation. Um, the way I like to run these counter narrative series is we really like to engage with you guys as the guests. Um, we encourage you to use the little tabs on the bottom. As some of you have already used the chat, um, we'll keep, um, keep in tabs with the chat. But also um, at the bottom of your Zoom bar, there's going to be a little button that has a Q&A. So if you click on that, you can put in a question um, during this entire forum. I'll be able to pull those up and ask those to our panelists throughout the conversation. Um, so we really wanna cater this conversation to what you guys as the guests are really interested in um, after we kind of get an introduction from these panelists. Um, so today we have joining us um, Dr. Gregory Cajete from Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, he's a recently retired from UNM, um, so we're excited to have him and he'll introduce himself in a little bit, as well as Melanie Laborwit. Um, she is the museum educator uh, with the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs up in Santa Fe, so New Mexico History Museum, New Mexico Museum of Art, and New Mexico State Historic Sites. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to them to introduce themselves a little bit more. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Cajete, if you don't mind. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Rachel and Melody, uh, thanks for inviting me to this, um, this panel. Uh, my name is Greg Cajete. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, recently retired from the University of New Mexico, where I was uh, uh, the former director of Native American of the Native American Studies program, and also uh, uh, American Indian Education. I, I'm an emeritus professor in the College of Education and Language Literacy Social Educator for oh, I'm going to say 46 years, maybe going on 47. I think. Uh, I've lost count. In other words, uh, I started my career at the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, uh, beginning in their high school program uh, as the high school science teacher. And then uh, as uh, that whole position evolved, I, I, I left after 21 years and after being the Dean of uh, Research and Cultural Exchange at the Institute, uh, and then went to the University of New Mexico where I, I have spent 26 years so, um, uh, so I, uh, you know, I've, I've really uh, uh, not left New Mexico, uh, unlike many colleagues and friends. Uh, I've uh, made it a point to stay in New Mexico and to be part of the New Mexico scene, so to speak. Um, 
I am by training a, a biologist, a field biologist. That was my first degree. Uh, but then I uh, got into native education, native science education, and uh, that's, that's become basically my passion. I'm also a self-taught artist. So I do a lot of work and am doing a lot of work right now in retirement and rekindling my skills as an artist. So I'm uh, just very happy to be here and uh, share some thoughts and perspectives about um, uranium, uranium mining, uh, Los Alamos Laboratory, and uh, uh, our collective future as, as the climate changes so dramatically. Thank you, Dr. Kehete. Um, Melanie, if you don't mind introducing yourself a little more. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, if you're watching it tomorrow or the next day. Um, my name is Melanie Laborowit, and I do indeed work as educator at the New Mexico History Museum. But um, part of the reason that I'm participating in this particular project is that I was involved as a curator for uh, an exhibition that we had at the History Museum on New Mexico's atomic histories a couple of years ago. And I was tasked with putting together a number of uh, it was first going to be a very small installation and I really got into the weeds and um, a lot of stories that I did not know about and um, a lot of other people did not know about um, sort of revealed themselves and so we really wanted to tell a more whole story about all things atomic in New Mexico, including the impact on the Native American community and on the environment, as well as the Manhattan Project. Um, and really understanding that um, the nuclear story in New Mexico is a statewide story. Um, I have worked both as an educator and as a museum professional at a lot of different museums in New Mexico. Um, I know a number of people who worked when I did at the Indian Public Cultural Center um, about a, a little over a decade ago. And um, I worked as an educator there. I also did some outreach in the interim um, where I learned quite a bit about this topic today and um, worked in outreach at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. And so really came to understand a little bit more about the science, um, not just the historical aspect of it. Um, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk about the subject. Um, there are some really important anniversaries um, that around this time. And I think that it's really a good time for um, people to re-examine um, the past and its legacy on us today. Awesome, thank you, Melanie. Um, I also wanted to give a little bit of background. Um, I neglected when I first started this to actually bring up why we're actually talking about it at this time. Um, we actually last year opened a exhibit called Radon Daughter, and it's the artwork by Dehaven Solomon Shapins from Laguna and Zuni. And uh, her work is really inspiring. Um, she um, and a lot of her family have deep ties to um, the jack pile uranium mine out there in Laguna. And so, you know, she really translated that into her own personal experiences and put it down in paper and kind of a hopeful, com hopeful conversation about where the future of the land is going. So um, in honor of that exhibit, um, we're actually extending that exhibit um, through the rest of this year. Um, well, almost the rest of the year. Um, but anyways, um, so we hope that um, we'll be able to open soon and be able to welcome everybody to visit that display sometime, but also you're welcome to check out online. We have some of her images. In fact, we have a blog um, on our website that talks about her experiences. Um, but with that, with that um, we'll move forward into a little bit more of um, the conversation and the topic at hand. Um, so I maybe wanted to hand it off to Dr. Kahete with all of his science experience to maybe um, tell us a little bit more, um, um, his perspective and maybe an indigenous perspective on uh, nuclear science and what makes it so special and unique. Oh, well, I'm hoping that I'm able to give that <laughs> a good uh, in, in uh, uh, less than 10 minutes, you know, uh, but uh, I'll try. Uh, you know, as, as I said, uh, my, my first degree was in science, uh, primarily a biological sciences, but uh, in my college career, in my undergraduate career, I actually did work 
uh, at Los Alamos, you know, as a uh, summer uh, college intern student, you know, they had a program that allowed for uh, students that were interested in science to, to actually have uh, summer internships in a variety of uh, areas, uh, a variety of departments there in Lano. And so I, uh, I actually worked, uh, I think, uh, three full summers uh, at, the, at the laboratory. Uh, I must say that it was, it was uh, money well, much needed <laughs> and well spent in the context of uh, being a poor uh, undergraduate student in those days. Uh, so I'm familiar with uh, the laboratory, certainly from that direct experience, but even, even before that, um, you know, uh, the laboratory uh, came, uh, you know, as, as uh, the war effort began to unfold, um, beginning, you know, really from a very small, uh, really summer camp, you know, uh, on the top of the Mesa there, uh, and then very rapidly being developed uh, as uh, the premier uh, site for the development of uh, the atomic bomb. Uh, the, uh, the, the context uh, of, um, of uh, Los Alamos at that time, of course, was highly uh, secretive, uh, but it also was in that area in New Mexico, uh, a kind of uh, amazing um, economic boon in the sense that uh, many, many people, both uh, Pueblo and Hispanic and and Anglo ranchers living in, in the vicinity were able to find jobs uh, actually building uh, Los Alamos. And so uh, not really knowing a, and understanding even at that time what nuclear science was and really even the purpose of uh, Los Alamos, uh, it certainly was uh, an economic boon for at least the, the, the area in, in, that, in that regard. Uh, that being said, uh, we also know that the federal government uh, essentially uh, annexed uh, part of uh, San Ildefonso Pueblo uh, to uh, build that, uh, that whole complex uh, along with um, uh, National Forest Land, uh, along with uh, several uh, private, uh, uh, private plots of land that uh, were held uh, by uh, various ranchers at that time. So uh, the land base was actually cobbled together uh, from a variety of different kinds of sources, you know, to create what we now see as uh, the, the Los Alamos uh, um, project. Um, in terms of nuclear science, uh, I think, um, uh, interestingly enough, many of the people that uh, began working there, you know, and, and uh, many of them came from Santa Clara and, and other pueblos as well, uh, used to call that area around Los Alamos Fire Mountain. And uh, I'm always, I always think of that term Fire Mountain because um, indeed uh, they were harnessing uh, the, uh, the power of the sun, you know, the, in, in terms of uh, creating uh, the atomic bomb and doing, uh, doing the necessary kind of research. Um, you're right in saying that it was, uh, uh, the project was really spread out throughout New Mexico. Uh, but again, Los Alamos really at that time was the focus. Uh, Los Alamos continues to be, you know, a, a very important economic, um, you know, driver in, in Northern New Mexico. Uh, I know the Lionel Foundation that, that was created uh, uh, a few decades ago has, has contributed a lot in terms of uh, science education and, and has been um, uh, trying to bring forward, you know, science as being an important area of education for uh, minority uh, students, uh, particularly there in uh, Northern New Mexico. Uh, but it's also been problematic, you know, in a much larger, broader context. Uh, while nuclear energy is, um, relatively speaking, clean energy, when it's being used, uh, it's not so clean when it's being mined and it's not so clean when it's in waste. And so we have uh, what I like to call, and uh, the term I've used with my students um, at UNM, uh, intractable conflict. 
um, in an intractable in an intractable conflict is a conflict that is um, it, it, it's neither good nor bad, but depending on where you're at in that process or in that context, uh, you begin to uh, be impacted, you know, by uh, what is happening at the laboratory and. Uh, and that's certainly that because uh, Los Alamos is um, uh, an international uh, laboratory, really. Uh, it brings uh, to Los Alamos and to northern New Mexico uh, people literally from all over the globe. Um, its primary purpose, of course, is, is uh, weapons uh, development. Uh, but in the past, it has also been involved with a variety of other projects that I think are amazing. Uh, in terms of uh, their potential for the future. Uh, but that being said, uh, this, is, uh, this is a real intractable conflict in, in the context of both the history of uh, LANL, uh, its, its current impact, its current position, you know, within Northern New Mexico. And I think that um, most scholars would admit that uh, New Mexico is a place where uh, these kinds of intractable conflicts tend to aggregate because this is not only the only intractable conflict in New Mexico, there are many, but uh, this certainly is one that has impacted and continues to impact uh, many of the people in northern New Mexico today. Uh, I think that uh, given the fact that, um, you know, uh, uh, Deb Holland was just inaugurated, uh, you know, as uh, the Secretary of Interior uh, that uh, some of the in indigenous perspectives of, about how you engage the land are going to become uh, very important topics within the Department of Interior. Uh, I think also that uh, it's very important for us to begin to educate ourselves about, um, about land, about environment, about responsibility, about re relationship, about respect. Uh, with regard to how we engage a landscape. And I think those are the kinds of questions um, that uh, this intractable conflict, which we call uh, the uh, LANL, you know, brings forward into New Mexico. There, there are going to be many kinds of uh, arguments and perspectives from many uh, angles. And that's the nature of, of intractable conflict. You have multiple kinds of positions, multiple agendas being playing out, played out simultaneously. But I'm hoping that the indigenous voice, uh, because of uh, uh, Deb Holland's, um, you know, inauguration will be, uh, will be one of the voices that will come to the table. Uh, because in the past, it has been neglected. It has been many times, um, uh, you know, um, overshadowed, so to speak, by, by uh, other kinds of uh, uh, economic or governmental interests. Um, so, I'm, so I'm hoping that, you know, that we're going to begin to see some very interesting kinds of things. Uh, again, uh, nuclear energy is, is um, being touted as clean energy, and it is. It is in, 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 its, in how it is being used, but also we have to look at the bigger context of uh, its impact on the environment, its impact on, on the peoples that are uh, a part of uh, this scenario of intractable conflict. And we also have to look at um, that the impact that uranium mining has on, on our environment and also uh, the, 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 the big issue, you know, of how to deal with radioactive wastes, which uh, truthfully, uh, we still don't have a real handle on, you know, we have a handle on how to put it away for a period of time, you know, in a more or less safe context. Uh, that's also part of the New Mexico scene. So New Mexico has the, the mining, New Mexico has the laboratory, and New Mexico also has the waste site. And so all three of those scenarios are playing out in New Mexico uh, as we speak. So that's what I know I would say uh, just in, in opening uh, our conversation today, Rachel, and I'll give uh, give way to Melanie for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, I know you have something that you were going to share the screen with, so I'll turn that to you. 
Yes, and I as as I'm I'm getting set to share the screen. I just wanted to make mention as as uh, Dr. Kahedi noted, one of the things that was most remarkable as um, we prepared to to focus on this exhibit was how New Mexico is really unique, almost in the world, in that we have been part of every single aspect. We're the only place in the world, really, that has been a part of every single aspect of the nuclear cycle, both in the mining of um, the fuel, the uranium, in the milling of it, in its preparation, um, in its processing. There is now a nuclear um, processing plant in the southern part of the state. Um, in the scientific research, in the development of the nu first nuclear weapon, the testing, the first bomb that was tested here in New Mexico in 1945 um, and um, you know all the way up to the present day with now with the nuclear waste disposal at WIP. And so the entire nuclear cycle is is something that we um, experience here. So I am going to um, be talking a little bit about let me see if I can just get this set up here. Um, the atomic histories. And I just want to start with this image, um, which was absolutely remarkable to me. Um, there was a fellow at the University of New Mexico who was doing some research on um, mining here in New Mexico and found some really remarkable images in um, popular science magazines where they, in the very early days of the discovery of uranium here in New Mexico, and I thought this was a really iconic image from a Union Carbide um, commercial that was in a scientific magazine that was trying to lure people who wanted to buy into the development of mines here in New Mexico. So I, I mean, this is a very iconic New Mexico landscape, um, which we'll learn about in a little, in a moment, which was very much, um, in and around all of the Laguna communities, Acoma and the Navajo communities in the Western part of the state. Um, I don't know if you can see this and I'd be happy to share this slide with anyone, but I did want to share this. We made a very large map with some of the important sites. Um, of course, the Manhattan Project is really what drew um, nuclear science here in the very first place, even before uranium was discovered in New Mexico, that was an unknown. Um, the reason why um, uh, Los Alamos became the site for the Manhattan Project was because um, Robert Oppenheimer himself had actually been out here to go camping numerous places, especially around Pecos up here. And he, um, and when they were discussing in New York about where we could put a secret site to study whether or not it was possible for contemporary physicists to use the energy from the fission that had just been discovered in 1939 to use that as a source of energy um, for a weapon to use against the Nazis before they developed it, he said, I know a secret place. And um, that is how they selected the Pajarito Plateau, which was just um, juxtaposed um, next to San Ildefonso and near to Santa Clara. Um, Santa Fe, of course, is where a lot of the scientists would arrive. Um, and their official address was Box 1663 in Santa Fe. Their families never knew that there was, there was no place on the map called Los Alamos at that time. Um, but I did want to share this map, especially for those who are visiting um, virtual visitors from other parts of the country to understand where we're talking about on a map of New Mexico. And this is just the state of New Mexico, how very far south by hundreds of miles and then hundreds of miles west that some of these other sites um, that became really significant in the development of uranium mining to the west. The yellow colored areas on the map are um, native communities and reservations. The Trinity site down here is where the first um, nuclear weapon was tested at the White Sands Missile Range, which it is today. You can see that it's very empty. This is a very empty area. It had been a small testing site, but um, nothing of this scope had ever been tested before. Um, I indicate Tula Rosa down here, which is a ranching community, mostly Hispanic, um, that 
also was enormously impacted and that today there's organizations of the Tularosa Downwinders who are asserting um, the um, finally getting um, their voices heard in Congress. In fact, in 2019, the very first hearing on the impact of the um, Trinity bomb on the people in this area, including Tularosa Downwinders, but also including um, Mescalero Apache in, in this region um, because of fallout, which was completely not exactly anticipated. They didn't exactly know what was gonna happen. It was an experiment after all. Um, so the, they are finally getting hearings in Congress um, and we'll probably be looking at hearing about some reparations. I indicate Roswell here, which was sort of after um, World War II. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but the earliest planes that flew over um, Nagasaki and Hiroshima that dropped the bombs there were part of the air command that became housed at Roswell after the war when the Army Air Command was there. And in Carlsbad is where today we have the waste isolation pilot plant and um, unit, which is just about 20 miles outside and of the town. And then Eunice, New Mexico, all right here, this tiny little place um, near the Texas border where there is a new um, uranium enrichment plant. I mentioned um, Robert Oppenheimer. These are two pictures of him very early in life. And you might say, why is this picture of a log cabin here? And a lot of people don't know this, but he had been kind of sickly in college and um, spoke to one of his professors and this was at Harvard. And his professor um, actually rented out this cabin every year near Cowles and at a dude ranch, if you will, at Los Pinos. And um, that was run by the Chavez family and told um, Robert and actually his brother encouraged them to come out over the summer um, so he would might feel better. He was, and uh, he came out in the summer of 1923 and almost every summer thereafter, he became quite a horseman. And he eventually even purchased property um, in this area that still belongs in the Oppenheimer family. And so there was this long heritage and his love of New Mexico. He even had written to friends that he had always wanted to combine his love of theoretical physics and New Mexico somehow. And um, little known to him, decades later, that opportunity would happen. Um, he was very familiar with the landscape. And I included this image because, which is from the, our photo archives. And both some of these images are from our collection, as well as collections of the Los Alamos Historical Society. And I'll indicate where they came from. Um, but this is an early photograph leading up to the Pajarito Plateau, which indicates how difficult it would be to get there. And if you really needed a place in New Mexico that was going to be um, isolated, there was this one road in and one road out. There wasn't a highway that went through like there is today across by Bandelier and so on that um, heads out to the west and down south to Jemez. Um, but the important thing, um, I think that's really important. Um, in fact, a lot of people are talking now about the Anthropocene era and you know what on earth does that mean? Um, the contemporary era that's affected by man, it really started here at the, the Trinity site, which was so named after a line in a John Donne poem that um, Oppenheimer had read. This is him here in his pork pie hat with General Leslie Groves. Um, the day after the bomb was detonated, it was not dropped from a plane as would be customary. Um, from other bombs and so on. It literally was a test. Just like any scientists, they worked feverishly to find out if there was such a thing as a weapon that could be developed um, that could use this new energy. It was literally suspended from this old water tower at the McDonald Ranch, which is now abandoned. Um, this site is open. Um, this is what's left of this tower after it was dropped. The land, you can see them wearing um, special coverings on their shoes, but um, the amount of radioactivity that was on the ground was 
astounding <laughs> after the this was i think this was photograph taken just about a day after and this is something that resulted there is a children's book called the green glass sea which talk is a fictional account of a a girl and her father who worked on the manhattan project where they dropped the bomb up for a, almost a mile in every direction it vitrified was so hot it vitrified the soil and created this new um element called trinitite that it was found nowhere else it's no longer there within a few a lot of rock hounds picked it up and this was sold all over the place through the 40s and 50s and the 60s and there's still sometimes at rock shops you can find that sort of thing but um today they the government has completely scraped this area up it is open on the first april and the first um, first Saturday in April and the first Saturday in November to visit the site. Um, this is an image, um, and I apologize for the um, typo. It was too small when I was working on my text again. Um, this image actually comes from um, the Bradbury Science Museum and um, the Los Alamos National Labs archive. They have, this is the 45th frame this is within a matter of seconds um, before there was even a minute um, image of that would sometimes be known as the mushroom cloud, which would grow. The um, bomb would have been dropped. This was taken from about 10 miles away and um, the it was detonated at about five in the morning. The sky would have still been dark, but almost instantly it was extraordinarily bright. Um, some people talked about you know, they didn't, they thought that the sun rose twice that day. Um, the bomb would have been dropped from about here to give you a sense of scale. And um, the extent of the fallout would be felt for a very long distance. They didn't know whether it'd be contained, but there were of course winds that would carry um, what became known as fallout. Um, and would later be discussed during the Cold War era. Um, a lot of fear of said fallout, since fallout shelters and so on being built. But what goes up must come down. And all of the earth that went up, excuse me, I, I, uh oh, I think I, um, I lost my space and I don't know why I got that. Hold on. I apologize. There we go. Um, so this is a close up of that um, piece of Trinitite that came from a place that was in Ojo Caliente, which is actually up northern New Mexico, that um, this would have been sold as a souvenir. Um, this gives you an idea of a um, map of um, the impact of the first bomb test here at ground zero or where it's indicated on the map is a zero point. And these concentric circles really indicate um, distance from th that original site. This is the McDonald Ranch House. And generally speaking, the fallout impacted people throughout this area and then drifted north and northeast um, towards Oklahoma. Um, this is um, a protester in the last decade um, among the uh, Tularosa Downwinders um, that have been advocating for their community and recognizing they didn't know what happened. There had been some ranches in this area that had been completely cleared out and government um, uh, purchased that land. And so they didn't know how far the impact was, but because there was fallout that went for further distances. Um, there were lots of stories about cows and their hair being burned on one side of their bodies where they were exposed to um, the radiation and um, how it impacted the grasses for many decades thereafter, which were then consumed by the cows and then um, New Mexicans who drank the milk that came from those cows. And let me see why won't this go to the next slide. There we go. Um, I just wanted to mention this really quick. Um, a lot of people don't know about things atomic except through pop culture. Um, the government um, started the Civil Defense Agency. Some people, it's really in some ways a precursor to the Department of Homeland Security. 
and um, created material that was consumed on television and in schools for people to understand during the Cold War that you could find um, shelter in the instance of a nuclear attack. And even as the Soviet warheads built up, um, we were all, Americans were sold the idea that we could survive such a thing. Um, meanwhile, and um, right after the war, um, Los Alamos National Laboratories and Sandia Corporation, which would become Sandia Labs um, in Albuquerque were developed um, to continue to work on nuclear research. First began as part of the Atomic Energy Commission and um, have continued to work through what is now the Department of Energy. Um, so uranium was not discovered in New Mexico until after the war. And um, I thought it was very interesting when doing research and I asked people in Los Alamos about mining in Western New Mexico. And they said, well, it isn't even weapons grade. Um, um, one of the, there were, it was very lucrative, however, and there were new uses that were being discovered for um, radioactive materials. And there, whether it's a myth or truth, I, I did not find a great deal of information. There is a story that even as there were people who were um, would be miners and people looking to excavate and find the mother load throughout the Mountain West. Um, looking for uranium as well as other minerals. The story is that a uh, Navajo man named Patty Martinez found um, some ore that looked like this, which not all uranium ore is this obviously uranium. It's, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's pitch blend, it's black, it looks like coal. Um, but he found some samples that looked like this and brought them into town into grants to get them assessed and um, was paid $100 for to share the location of where that site was that he had found that um, mineral. Um, within short order after um, that happened, um, there were numerous companies, not just small excavations um, and, and individuals, but larger companies would move into the area um, laying claims to different parts of um, what are essentially federal lands generally located on or very near to tribal lands throughout the western part of the state and because of the um, interest in the greater good if you will for the federal government and newer in these new industries, um, grants were made to start mining. Grants, New Mexico, once um, the carrot capital of New Mexico became a center for uranium mining um, and headquarters, for, and it was a real boom town and headquarters for numerous different companies. This photograph was taken a couple of years ago. Um, there was mining that was underground. It was extremely dangerous. This is a replication of an open hall in the mine. Uh, a stope is sort of a room is what they would call that. This is recreated at the Grants Mining Museum, um, which I actually recommend. It was really, it recreates the experience of being down there, both um, understanding what a heavy industrial um, enterprise it was, as well as an enormous amount of danger. Um, one of the things that was pointed out even by the docent who had been a miner at one time was hey, that- I'm gonna interrupt yes. you just a second and give you a one minute warning. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to, I'm sorry, this is the stove. I did wanna point out the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up too much time. I just, in the area airing on- uh, No, it's good stuff, but just- On conclusion, clear. sure. Yeah. So these um, were some Navajo miners, which would use almost a jackhammer against inside the walls and there would be dust flying. And as you can see, they're up to their knees in a slurry, which would have been filled with um, uranium mud, if you will. Um, this, but there was, this is the jack pile mine that I think um, we're gonna be talking about a little bit more. And this is a, a photo that was done um, by Lee Marmon. And there's a collection of his images he took 
at the Jack Pyle Mine that are at um, UNM, which are really quite remarkable. And this was right outside Pawati Village. And it's one of the things that stunned me when I learned more about the open mining is that the village was literally right here. And just below it, the way that they would get to the mineral in the mine was that a detonation would be set off of dynamite along the ridge. And then the whole ridge would crumble, whoop, I didn't mean to do that, would crumble down. And then large trucks and um, vehicles would carry it to the front where it would be crushed. Um, and so this represents, this, this is an image of a Navajo miner that was from a Life magazine um, in 1953, which celebrated all of these wonderful advancements and new jobs in the area. And this is an image of Dorothy Purley, who was a miner at the Jack Pyle Mine. She became a truck driver and later uh, developed cancer and she became a cancer survivor who became a prominent activist even at the UN to helping to get the mines closed down in the 1980s and I talk about social upheaval because there were lots of women like this um, who in younger days who also um, started working and it changed the um, nature of women's and men's roles um, both in the home and outside um, afterwards, the other thing that I wanted to make mention that I put on the map was um, the disaster at Church Rock, New Mexico. This at one time, if you can imagine rock extending for all the way from one's end to the other and then being pushed apart. This was a part of a natural dam which held um, over 90 million gallons of radioactive uh, sludge that was released into the Rio Puerco watershed. And a lot of people think Three Mile Island was the worst disaster in um, the United States for nuclear development. And um, what happened at Church Rock, which I never knew about, um, and I think a lot of people never knew about, is now a super fun site. Um, I did um, talk a little bit about the development of Los Alamos after, in, um, after World War II. And of course, WIP and where Eunice is in the eastern part of the state. But um, just to bring us back, and I'm going to uh, quit sharing my screen if I can. And I don't know if I can find the prompt for that. <laughs> Excuse me. It should just be uh, at the very top. There's like a little green bar. And yeah, you should there be should, to... but I think I have to shrink my screen again. And I'm trying to remember how to do that. You can just press escape. Am I still with you? Yes. Okay. Oh, there we are. Um, no, there we're not. I'm going to make that smaller. Here we go. I found out how to stop you by myself. So there Okay. <laughs> Bring me back. There we go. Awesome. Sorry about that. No, thank you. It's a it's a lot of history to get through that I asked you to do in such a short time. So I think you did an awesome job. Um, so kind of the next, like the last 15 minutes that we have here, um, I really encourage everybody to, if they have a question, um, either drop it in the chat or in the question and answer, you can access those at the bottom. Or if you're um, on a phone call, you're welcome to, um, I think it's, uh, if you dial, like pound nine, I can't remember. Um, uh, you can raise your hand if you have a question as well. Um, so we'll have our panelists answering some questions and I'll kind of open it up with some of the questions that I had for them, but um, please, please um, consider asking them your questions that you're dying to hear um, on this topic. Um, so first I kind of want to open it up and um, uh, I think we kind of started this conversation really well, just talking about the importance of putting things in context of history and what things we can learn from that history. And so I would like um, each of our panelists, if they could share something from New Mexico history with radioactive materials and handling and that history and um, how we can utilize that knowledge today um, when we're dealing with those lasting impacts that those moments had. So maybe we'll break it up and Dr. Kahete will go first this time too. Okay, uh, well, thank you, uh, Melanie, for a really well-developed uh, 
PowerPoint uh, on the history of um, of everything, uranium, Los Alamos uh, impacts in New Mexico. Um, I would want to really emphasize as, as I started with uh, this whole idea of uh, the intractable conflict, uh, you know, as, a, as an idea, because um, uh, what, what many times uh, people don't know and, and really don't to hear the stories of unless you've experienced it yourself, is that, uh, you know, New Mexico was a very poor state and uh, there, are, there has been even some, some research done in terms of uh, Oppenheimer's original uh, intent uh, to find a place that was secret enough to begin to do some experiments with regard to uh, uh, fission. And um, what, uh, what, what's also not stated is that uh, the government was looking for one of the least populated states, one of the poorest states, a place that had land that, uh, because they really weren't sure about how some of the experiments could go, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of just devastation, you know, to the population. So they wanted, they wanted a place that was away from large population areas. And so that's how New Mexico got chosen. Uh, it's many times termed as uh, a national sacrifice site. And uh, of course, uh, today we're looking at uh, in the, the in terms of social justice, in terms of in environmental racism, in terms of uh, uh, histories uh, that have gone untold, uh, we're beginning to take a look at history, you know, through those lenses. And uh, indeed, New Mexico is one of the places where all of those kinds of uh, considerations, I think, are very important. And if you're going to know the full story of, um, of uh, uranium in New Mexico, the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that, you know, uh, Los Alamos is doing, the, you know, cutting edge international research in lots of areas. It is also a uh, place where research is done, you know, with regard to um, arms, uh, nuclear arms. It was the birthplace of the atomic bomb. Um, at the same time, it was uh, a place where many, uh, many northern New Mexicans, many New Mexicans actually found um, livable wage work. Uh, it had impacts in, in the context of that, uh, in terms of the infrastructure of the state. So this is what uh, a intractable conflict is, you see, because it has all of the different kinds of, of flavors, all the different kinds of agendas happening. Uh, I think that very seriously that uh, given uh, the current stage that we are in you, with regard to looking at uh, past histories, looking at uh, environmental racism, looking at structural racism, uh, certainly New Mexico and, and certainly the, the Manhattan Project uh, has been one of the, the uh, lightning rod, so to speak, for the kinds of activism and the kinds of of uh, recollection of, uh, of uh, social equity, environmental racism. And this continues to be, I think, a very large um, area of, uh, of uh, discussion, of reflection. I know that many of my students in uh, Native American studies at the University of New Mexico have, have studied uh, the impacts of uranium, uranium mining, both on Navajo and also in terms of Laguna. Uh, they've also studied, you know, the history of uh, Los Alamos. Um, many times the stories uh, and the voices uh, uh, that you saw in one of the slides, a uh, veteran, uh, the Don Winters, uh, we don't know uh, really uh, long-term effects of uh, even uh, low uh, amounts of radiation, again, food and soil and the air. Um, the research is getting better but uh, really long-term impact uh, is still yet to be understood. And so I think those are the kinds of issues that um, the people, uh, particularly the people who now live in New Mexico, who are uh, adjacent to Los Alamos are, are the kinds of questions uh, that are going to be asked and are being asked and have been asked, you know, with regard to, um, 
at what cost has has uh, the laboratory come to New Mexico? And so uh, it's going to be a long debate. Uh, let's put it that way. And I think that uh, as time goes by, we're going to begin to to hear much more about this debate. You know, with regard to uh, Los Alamos, its impact on New Mexico. So that's all I want to say now. I wish we had more time, you know, because this is a huge, a huge. It's enormous. It's an enormous subject, and to really to do it justice in such a short time. But I think we can at least touch on the themes, you know, that that are playing out also. Um, uh, you know, science itself, Western science itself, uh, and you know, I, I'm known for writing about this. Uh, really has to begin to take a much broader look. Look at what it does, how it does, and and around um, human need, um, because we we also understand that science is is a very powerful institution. It's it's a very powerful uh, foundation of knowledge, but it also. Um, it, has been uh, colonized and has been a colonizer. You know, so as we begin to take a look at, uh, at decolonizing ourselves and decolonizing education as practice. And I know that a lot of really good scientists are doing that right now, particularly with regard to climate change and some of the issues that that has brought forward. And so I commend those scientists that are doing that, that good work, that very honest work uh, but there's a lot, lot more work to be done, um, and hopefully younger scientists, and I hope also that native scientists, you know, become a part of that that conversation, uh, that 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 transformation that I think is so important and so needed uh, as we move forward into the challenges of climate change. Definitely, thank you. I think you touched on um, maybe a couple of these questions that came through. Um, I might yeah. interject and. Um, I think really quickly, if each of you, um, maybe one or two, because I think this is, um, it kind of answers some of the things. So um, first of all, um, we had a question specifically on the Green Glass Sea, um, as far as that book being available, but also mm -hmm. just suggested readings on the topic. I don't know if you guys maybe have like one or two books or- Actually, to yeah. Read. I was, um, one of my, one of the most remarkable things that happened was I actually, when I went out to Laguna and I had a meeting with, they set up their own environmental protection agency. Cause in the early days of, after the mine was closed, um, the EPA was supposed to do some of the cleanup or enforce some of the mines taking care of their open sludge, whatever. And they ended up starting their own environmental protection agency, which I thought was remarkable. And so there is a team of Native American scientists, as well as some people from the outside who have come to work on the reservation for specifically for reclamation and um, reparation and repair. But from there, I learned about there had been a teacher, amazingly enough, at Laguna Middle School, um, and I'm not sure if he's still working out there, but he created in 1998 a curriculum <clears throat> and study guide called Uranium Mining and its Impact on Laguna Pueblo and um, by Philip Sitnik. And it was an absolutely amazing um, resource. I think you can still download it. <laughs> um, I was able to find it online a couple of years ago and um, it was written in collaboration. There was a committee on nuclear risk management for native communities project. Um, Dorothy Purley, who um, I mentioned, who since has passed away, was among the number of former miners who were interviewed for the project. Um, and it really speaks from the voice of the community and was very inform informational, both on really the teacher created science units as well as social studies teachers units to teach the, the really the co whole complex and it was really impactful. Awesome, thank you. Um, Dr. Kihiti, did you have uh, any recommendations for people for more information? And then this will be my last, our last thing and then we'll wrap up. Well, I, I know that, uh, you know, uh, Zimmerman Library actually has uh, uh, really a very good collection of uh, research. You have, just has to type in nuclear, uh, the nuclear industry in New Mexico, and you're going to get 
a variety of different hits, you know, with regard to things. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's so massive that you can, you know, you you find you find all sorts of things. Uh, and of course, you know, in in terms of the popular Google, you can also find a, a tremendous amount of material. But I would just just suggest that people really um, really do their homework, you know, uh, um, and, and really begin to explore, uh, you know, what what are the um, the kinds of real histories and the stories behind. Uh, many of the, much of the activism that has gone on really for decades, you know, with regard to uranium mining and also with regard to Los Alamos and also with regard to uh, nuclear energy and, um, and really the, the nuclear uh, arsenals that uh, many countries now have. And so it, it's, a, it's a huge debate, you know, it's a huge debate. Um, New Mexico and, and our, our little space here in New Mexico was uh, one of the places where some of this started, but of course now it's globalized and it really is uh, a global phenomenon. Uh, I think that um, we really have to begin to understand, um, first of all, in New Mexico, we have to understand our own histories. And, and I think uh, a lot of us uh, many times don't have access to that history in ways that we should within our schools, within our educational institutions. So it's then up to each individual then to uh, research these kinds of topics if they're interested and if it's uh, something that uh, has impacted them, I think it's important for them to understand um, the nature of that history. Uh, so as an educator, I'm giving you the education spiel. You know, please educate yourself about this very important issue that has impacted us and will continue to impact us into um, many generations into the future. And so uh, I think I would leave it with that. Um, we, need to, we need to have a better relationship you know, with the natural world. And we have to really begin to, to explore how science uh, can bring us you know, to that place. And I think that's what many scientists are beginning to, to realize and beginning to do. Thank you so much for your words, Dr. Kahite, and um, also Melanie. Um, we're coming up right at the end of the time. Um, I know Melanie's been kind of working on answering some of your questions in the chat, but I also just wanted to do a really great plug for, um, I know we said that this is such a short time to cover such a big topic, and that's really why we expanded this over a three-month series. Um, so, um, we are coming up on the second part of the series, which will happen on Wednesday, Mar or April 21st um, at the same time. Um, and that session, um, we're gonna be taking a deeper look at the conditions and the impact of the mines. So really looking at the um, 50, 1950 to 1980, 1990. Um, so we already have a guest panelist lined up for that one. We're gonna be joined by Marion Naranjo, who has worked very diligently with uh, San Clara Pueblo um, and San Ildefonso and Table Learn United to really establish a lot of history and insights on the impact really of those. Um, and then session number three, which will be in May, is gonna be the last part of our series where we're gonna to talk to some of those uh, contemporary people that are really dealing with these impacts. We're gonna finally get to Haven on to talk with us um, as well as a couple others. Um, so a lot of these questions you guys are answering will definitely um, roll over into future conversations. Um, so I just wanted to drop into the chat. Um, for those of you that have registered, um, you had the option to add um, the rest of this series to your calendar. Um, but if you haven't, oh, sorry, I just sent that to Melanie. I wanted to send that to everybody. Um, <clears throat> but if you didn't register for the rest of this series, please um, follow that link I just dropped into the chat um, and that will get you signed up for the rest of the series so you can continue this conversation. Um, I also look forward to um, incorporating some of these questions into the upcoming conversations. So I appreciate the questions and I apologize we didn't have enough time to get to them today. Um, and finally, I really would like to thank um, each of you for joining in this program and really supporting us at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. Um, I would like to invite you um, 
to consider um, these programs, we really strive to bring them to you for free or um, it's really, we wanna be here to give you education and give you the tools to um, understand our Pueblo people and our history here in New Mexico. Um, so anything that you can either donate or consider becoming a member, um, we appreciate that. It helps us continue to put on these um, conversations and bring these really awesome guests like that we have today um, to share your knowledge, to share their knowledge with you. Um, uh, any help goes a long way. Um, uh, and lastly, um, just really a big thank you to uh, Dr. Kahete and Melanie Laborowit for joining us. Um, I really appreciated your insights and everything that you were able to share. Um, and we are going to manage to finish just on time. So again, check in on those future conversations and we can answer some of those other questions. Feel free to also reach out to um, me. My email is attached to this webinar if you have additional burning questions that um, we can maybe have a more offline conversation. So with that, thank you for joining us and have an enjoyable evening. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you as well, Rachel. Uh, good luck with uh, the rest uh, of the panels in your series. I uh, appreciate it very much that you invited me. And uh, to the audience, I, I hope you do your homework, as a good teacher would say, and uh, that you will become the expert in the, the questions that you have asked. Um, because all teachers can do is really clear the way and facilitate your thinking. And hopefully I've done that this uh, evening. Thank you again.